Our next speaker is a Danish historian, author, editor, and former president of the Free Press Society, and now editor of Dispatch International, Lars Hedegaard, who survived an assassination attempt in January 2013. Please welcome Lars Hedegaard. Thank you, Catherine, for this most auspicious welcome. Unfortunately, it has been my lot today to speak about the most boring subject um, on offer. Uh, the title of my speech is Free Speech in the Shadow of Sharia. Um, it seems natural for people born and raised within Western culture to regard law as something that has been decided at some specific point in history. It may have been dictated by some undemocratic authority, like a king or a chieftain, or it may have been decided by some representative assembly. We do not understand the nature of laws that are claimed to have existed for eternity, even before they were human beings, and laws that will exist for eternity after the last human being has disappeared from the universe. But that is what we are asked to believe in the case of Sharia. Sharia is the law that is distilled from Islamic holy scripture. That is because the Quran has always existed on a, as they say, preserved tablet in heaven, which Allah has caused to descend so that it finally ended with a man by the name or rather title perhaps of Muhammad who according to tradition died in 632. In other words, as every word in the Quran stems directly from Allah, not a word can be changed. And unlike the New Testament, which most European Christians interpret as the work of human beings describing their faith, it is God himself who speaks in the Quran. And consequently, it is blasphemy and sacrilege for any human being to disbelieve or change a single word. In the process of transmitting his eternal words to Muhammad, Allah also invested Muhammad, Muhammad with the role of the perfect human being whose words and actions must be followed and emulated for all time. That is why the so-called hadith renditions of Muhammad's words and actions are as important as the Quran itself. And if we talk about Sharia, the hadith are even more important because most of the rules of the Sharia are rooted in them. To top it all off, in the Quran, Allah declares that Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. This is generally taken to mean that there will be no prophets after Muhammad and that Allah has thus given his final message to mankind through him. In other words, Allah has been out of reach since the 7th century. Nothing can be altered, essentially nothing can be added, nothing can be subtracted from the Sharia. And lest one thinks that the Sharia is some nebulous concept, one is well advised to consult the authentic Sharia law book, whose English title is the reliance of the traveler. Here one will find on 815 pages in small print very concrete rules about all manner of matters large and small. For example, how to catch and treat slaves, how to wage holy war, how to administer a caliphate, how to have sex, how to beat your wife, 
how to distinguish jinns, some deserts, some, some, some apparitions in the desert, we would call them ghosts, how to distinguish jinns from angels, how to determine what cheese is good for you, and much more. The sky is the limit when it comes to Allah's desire to keep an eye on human behavior. In our Western culture, it is customary to speak of strict interpretations versus softer interpretations of the Sharia. Interestingly, we almost invariably hear such sentiments expressed by non-Muslims. The few Muslims who have dared to take issue with the Sharia or venture to suggest alterations have historically been labeled apostates and as such deserving of death. The Sharia law book minces no words, quote, when a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed, end quote. The reliance of the traveler makes it clear that an apostate can be killed with impunity. In addition, as Ayan Hirsi Ali has pointed out, the implementation of the Sharia is in the hands of every single Muslim, meaning that any Muslim has the right to kill anybody deemed to have deviated from the straight and narrow. This raises an interesting question. What does it take to be accused of having left Islam? Again, the reliance of the traveler is very specific and lists no less than 20 acts pronouncements and even suspicions of future acts and pronouncements that qualify the culprit to, uh, for the title of apostate who has left Islam and must therefore die. Let me quote a few. Quote, to intend to commit unbelief even in the future. End quote. To revile Allah or his messenger to deny any verse of the Quran or anything which by scholarly consensus belongs to it. To describe a Muslim or someone who wants to become a Muslim in terms of unbelief. Think about that. In other words, you deserve to be killed if you do not believe what a Muslim says. Of course, what applies to apostates applies manifold to non-Muslims. That is the reason we are here today in commemoration of the murder of Theo van Gogh. The man who killed him is blameless in the eyes of Islam. In fact, he is a hero and an exemplar for all true Muslims to follow. As those who murdered Pim for Town, who tried to butcher Kurt Westergaard, Lars Wilkes, not Wilkes, sorry, and the journalists at Ulands Boston, and who would gladly eliminate any one of us here. Fortunately, I can assure journalists from Radio Denmark and the Daily Politiken that they will be quite safe for the time being. The same goes for university experts, the cultural idols, and the politicians, as long as they keep servicing the imams and their backers in Turkey, Pakistan, Saudi, Iran, or wherever they may be. They will be the last ones to have their throats slit or their heads blown off, unless they remember to convert to the Prophet in time, that is. I'm sure many of them will do so when they're through preaching sweet understanding and multiculturalism to the rest of us. As you will notice, Islam leaves no room at all for free speech. None. The only speech that is free is what is commensurate with every last detail of the Sharia. Of course, nobody <coughs> sorry, can remember all the details, and nobody can be sure exactly what uh, is, uh, he is supposed to follow uh, according to Sharia. For example, how many can remember to be decently clothed so that the ghosts won't see him naked, as it says in the, in the, in the book? How many can remember that it is not obligatory to clean yourself 
if you have only farted or has excreted substances without moisture when you go to the bathroom. It takes a lifetime to learn all the rules. Perhaps that is one of the reasons why so many Muslims have little time to produce anything useful. Fortunately, there's no end to the number of imams and other holy men who can tell the true believers exactly what to do under all circumstances. They are even respected and revered by our media, the cultural elites, and most politicians. Allow me to mention two objections to this analysis, which I'm sure that some of you might like to voice. First, many Muslims do not follow the letter of the Sharia. That is certainly true, but it doesn't change anything. The Sharia cannot be altered by the fact that some Muslims do not abide by every last stricture. It is like the Danish penal code. The fact that some Danes violate it does not change the penal code. Two, the other objection is that we may hope for some change. Perhaps we might hope that some sort of moderate Islam may emerge sometime in the future. People holding this view think that sometime in the future Muslims will demand a so-called reformation of Islamic orthodoxy. I sincerely hope that will happen, but I'll believe it when I see it. Muslims have had 1,400 years to civilize and domesticate their ideology, and it hasn't happened yet. Surveys of Muslim opinion indicate that a great number of Muslims do not advocate holy war, do not advocate the killing of infidels and apostates, and the elimination of free speech. Doesn't that count? I'm afraid the answer is no. What matters is who is in command of the Ummah, that is, the nation of Islam, and what methods they are willing to apply in order to intimidate and silence all doubters. I'm sure that a great number of Germans uh, in the days of Hitler abhorred National Socialism. The same may be said of millions of Russians and Chinese who would rather be rid of Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and Mao. They made no impact because the upholders of national socialist and communist orthodoxy were willing to use whatever methods it took to silence them. That is the way it's been with Islam for 1400 years. My conclusion is that whenever and wherever Islam makes inroads into Western societies, our our liberties are under attack. And the first to go is free speech. Right now, we are experiencing an avalanche of Muslim immigration. The numerical balance between Westerners and Muslims is changing rapidly, and free speech is ebbing away. Those who insist on upholding free speech risk their lives and sometimes lose them. Our politicians couldn't care less. Otherwise, they would stop Muslim mass immigration. They do exactly the opposite. If they really wanted to integrate Muslims in our societies, as they pretend, they would put a stop to imams and other holy men who preach strict adherence to Sharia and threaten those who would rather be free. Our politicians, with some notable exceptions, do the opposite. They prosecute and vilify proponents of our ancient liberties. I'll leave it to all of you to imagine how this will end. Thank you. And now, everybody can ask questions or make a comment to Lars Hedegaard. Yes, yeah, but just a minute, yeah, but just a minute. The mic. Always nice to speak, Lars. As you know, I am a secular Jew. We know each other very well. I would like to ask you a very simple question. 
which is, if you look at the halakha, which is the Jewish law, the ancient Jewish law, there are many similarities between this law and the Sharia. There are big differences, but there are also many similarities. Why is it that there is such a huge difference between how it's actually implemented in modern life? If you have a, an, an idea. I, uh, at the risk of offending you, uh, which is not easy to be let me venture to guess. Um, I guess that Judaism has become civilized due to its experience of the Western world after being living for thousands of years in such countries as Denmark and, and Holland and the US, you know, the idea of cutting off the heads of infidels is not that appealing. Uh, but really the difference is that uh, the Jewish law may be and is uh, despicable, um, evil, and whatnot as as uh, Bible. But very few people would that would uh, kill because of that. They would not, very few people want to deprive other Jews of their civil uh, democratic rights because they don't, they, because they eat pork. And as you know, many do. Yes. Other questions or comments? And of course, the speakers in the panel are welcome to comment. Perhaps Daniel, you might have something to say about Lars's speech. I don't think you agree on, on, on the sus on, on the, uh, when it comes to moderate Islam and whether or not Islam can be reformed? Uh, well, Lars did say that moderate Islam can exist, and that is key for me. Uh, we will agree that it does not exist in any strength today, and we hope it will exist, and I would say that our policies should be directed towards encouraging a moderate Islam. It is possible. That's very key. Um, on the point about the difference between Jewish and Islamic law, I'd like to make two distinctions. First is that Jewish law is only private law. There's no public law. There's not a law of warfare and taxation mm. and administration and so forth. And secondly, uh, Islam is a religion of supremacism. The Muslim is better than the non-Muslim. Judaism doesn't have that assumption. Yes. Besides, uh, Judaism does not proselytize, uh, does not want to, to convert, as far as I know, people by the sword and kill them uh, if they don't want to, to, to convert them. Your point is what I'm saying. Uh, if I may say a couple of words more. We do agree that modern Islam could be a possibility, but it cannot be a possibility as long as the Imams and the holy men hold sway over the Ummah. I think that is absolute, absolutely key to understanding the prospects. The current Imams and holy men are the problem, but they could be different Imams and holy men. There are some who uh, are more modern and who have better points of view. I think there are two key kinds of figures. One are these scholars who look at the Quran and reinterpret it. And secondly, are the leaders, the activists. And I think a great example would be Nasser Khadr, who is a politician, and was a politician and a leader. It's those two, scholars and leaders among Muslims who reject Islamism, and I think there's hope. At least we should endeavor to help them towards that goal. Ask, do you want to? Uh, no. But, okay, and then I'll just make a short comment on Nasser Kader, who is a great man, but I don't think many Muslims in Denmark regard him as a Muslim. <laughs> so that is sort of the problem. He's far too liberal. He's far too Danish. He's far too Christian. So that's part of the problem. We have to reform the Quran as well. And that's a very hard job to do. Very risky. But it was just a short comment. Anyone else? No? <coughs> Well, if that is the case, we will carry on with the next speech, the next speaker, Daniel Pye.